Hi everyone, welcome to the HBMN Research Roundup. I'm your host, Dr. Brianna Stubbs. I love staying up to date with the latest scientific literature, and in our research roundup, we'll take a look at some of the most topical and interesting things that I found down the rabbit hole of the research world. I'll walk you through how the experiments were conducted, discuss the results and implications, and share my thoughts on the study and the subject as a whole. The broad field of nutrition and health is rife with myths, misconceptions, and frequently posed, yet seemingly fundamental questions that we intuitively feel that should have simple answers. Is a calorie a calorie? Is obesity due to eating too much or doing too little? Is breakfast the most important meal of the day? Now that's what we're going to focus on today. To answer that last question, we must define both what is meant by breakfast and what is meant by important. Framing our question in terms of whether breakfast is the most important meal of the day also implies some inherent value in comparing breakfast with other daily eating occasions. Why should the potential benefits of breakfast, and therefore our decisions about breakfast consumption, depend on the relative importance of lunch and dinner? For example, Breakfast consumption is unlikely to be more important for our general health than physical exercise or, say, not smoking, but that does not discount that breakfast may be sufficiently important to form part of a wider, healthy lifestyle. In fact, markers of a healthy lifestyle are actually associated with frequent breakfast consumption, and this confounds interpretation of causal links between breakfast and good health. So that just means people who are healthier are more likely to eat breakfast and you can't really separate the two. One issue contributing to the apparently conflicting findings in this area is that there is no universally accepted definition of breakfast. And let's think about it, why should there be? Without thinking about it too hard, it might at first seem logical simply to define breakfast as the first meal of the day. This is then consistent with the etymology to break the fast. And this can kind of work for some as a general description of breakfast, but it is logically flawed and not overly helpful as a scientific definition. Consider an individual who breaks their fast shortly after waking by ingesting energy from carbohydrate, protein, and fat in the form of coffee, milk, and sugar, and then nothing else until the early afternoon when the same mix of macronutrients plus some alcohol are consumed, but this time in the form of spaghetti bolognese and a glass of red wine. Opinions may now be divided about whether this person had breakfast at all, and if so, whether it was the coffee and or spaghetti and the wine. Can we count a cup of coffee as a meal? Was the spaghetti consumed in the fasted state when the person is post-absorbative? What if we switch up our thought experiment a little bit and we learn that this person actually woke up at midday? What counts as breakfast? One thing it's important to note is that many, many studies have verified that there is an association between omitting breakfast and obesity. And studies continue to emerge even today, despite that relationship having been confirmed by several meta-analyses. There can be little doubt, therefore, that individuals who more frequently consume breakfast tend to be leaner, and that this pattern hardly varies across a very, very diverse range of human populations. However, no matter how strong these correlations may be, they cannot be used to draw a causal inference, and so cannot inform evidence-based recommendations either encouraging or discouraging breakfast for the purposes of weight control. Breakfast omission, or skipping breakfast, affects some components of energy balance much more than others. There's no evidence to suggest that breakfast consumption per se affects your resting metabolic rate, which I think is a concept we're all familiar with, or diet-induced thermogenesis, which means the energy that's required to actually break down your food. There is evidence that breakfast affects energy intake, and it's compelling for laboratory studies. And the majority of these studies show that energetic compensation occurs at the next meal, but that this is not sufficient to eliminate the deficit from morning fasting. In addition, designs where afternoon or evening feeding has been allowed do not demonstrate sustained compensation for breakfast omission. Experiments outside the laboratory understandably produce more varied results, with the balance of evidence suggesting that energy intake is either lower or similar when omitting breakfast. 
Clearly there is not a simple answer to our initial question. Breakfast may or may not be the most important meal of the day, but it is certainly an important meal to investigate further. And that's where we're going to jump into our paper for this week. The paper was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, and the title reads, Restricting carbohydrates at breakfast is sufficient to reduce 24-hour exposure to postprandial hyperglycemia and improve glycemic variability. This paper was actually written by Professor Jonathan Little from the University of British Columbia. And in one of our previous research roundups, we discussed a paper he authored about the effects of ketone esters on inflammation. Now, diabetics typically experience a larger blood sugar spike following a breakfast conforming to the traditional nutritional guidelines. This is due to a combination of a more pronounced insulin resistance in the morning in these people with diabetes, and also because the typical healthy Western breakfast foods such as cereal, oatmeal, toast, and fruit juices are very, very high in carbohydrates. Because of these things, breakfast is consistently a problem meal that leads to the largest blood sugar spikes for people with type 2 diabetes. This paper aimed to explore if eating a low carb and high fat semi-keto meal first thing in the morning could be a simple way to actually prevent this large spike in blood glucose and improve glycemic control throughout the day, which in the long run could reduce other complications of diabetes. Study participants with well-controlled type 2 diabetes completed two experimental feeding days. On one day, they ate an omelette, eggs, yay, for breakfast, and on another day, they ate some oatmeal and some fruit. The two breakfast meals were matched in calories. All that was different was the macronutrient split. And the participants were then provided with an identical lunch and dinner on both days, and these meals contained an equal mix of carbs, proteins, and fats that conformed to more standard dietary recommendations. A continuous glucose monitor, which is a small device that attaches onto your abdomen or forearm and measures glucose every five minutes, was used to monitor their blood sugar fluctuations across the whole day. Participants also reported their ratings of hunger, fullness, and their desire to eat something either sweet or savory throughout the day. The results of the study confirmed the hypothesis that consuming a very low carbohydrate, high fat breakfast completely prevented the blood sugar spike after breakfast. Very importantly, this had enough of an effect to lower overall glucose exposure and improve the stability of glucose readings for the next 24 hours, which is a key finding as there was speculation if the insulin or glucose responses to food later in the day may have been adversely affected by consuming a low low carbohydrate breakfast and having a lower insulin at the start of the day. So this paper confirmed that these fears were unfounded. While cereals are often lauded as the breakfast of champions, the results of this paper suggest that people with type 2 diabetes should be reaching for something else altogether. Listeners of this podcast are unlikely to be surprised by the finding that a high fat, low carb, keto end of the spectrum breakfast can help with blood glucose control throughout the day. I think we're kind of preaching to the choir here. In an interview, Professor Little explained, we expected that limiting carbohydrates to less than 10% at breakfast would help to prevent the spike after the meal. But we were a bit surprised that this had enough of an effect and that the overall glucose control and stability were improved this much. Why is this so important, you might ask? Well, actually we know that these large swings in blood glucose are very, very damaging to our blood vessels, eyes, and kidneys, and really can just cause a lot, a lot of downstream complications to type 2 diabetes. So the inclusion of a very low carbohydrate, high fat breakfast meal in these type 2 diabetics patients may be a practical and easy way to target this large morning glucose spike and reduce all of these associated complications. Another interesting finding of this paper was that the participants know noticed that their pre-meal hunger and also their cravings for sweet foods later in the day tended to be lower if they ate the low-carb breakfast, suggesting that this meal is really setting them up to stick to their diet goals for the rest of the day. The results of this study suggest potential benefits of altering your macronutrient distribution throughout the day so that carbohydrates are restricted at breakfast and then consuming a balanced lunch and dinner rather than consuming an even distribution and a moderate amount of carbohydrates throughout the day. I think that this is a super empowering finding. So many people are put off keto or low carb eating as it's kind of portrayed as all 
or nothing, and going all in is a big commitment. What these results show is that you can move the needle on your metabolic health even just by making a small change to your macronutrients for one meal at breakfast. There are a few small points to note with the study methodology. Firstly, the use of CGMs makes the most practical sense for this type of study as it avoids repeated blood sampling, but these devices aren't as accurate as lab-grade analytical equipment for measuring glucose. In my view, this really wouldn't have affected the results of the paper too much. Another point is that this paper was an acute one-off experiment. So it's not totally clear if eating a low carb breakfast every day would provide more stable blood glucose over the long term and if any adaptations might occur to compensate. Also, these results don't show if this degree of reduction in insulin and glucose exposure could meaningfully affect the clinical complications of diabetes. That is assumed based on our broader understanding of type 2 diabetes metabolism. Lastly, this experiment was done with people living with diabetes and so it's not totally clear from these results that healthy people without diabetes would have the same response, but I think it's not too far-fetched to suggest that healthy people would also have a smaller glucose spike after an omelette compared to oatmeal. My key takeaway here is that whatever change you can make to your diet to cut out these big glucose spikes, it's all a step in the right direction. Whether or not breakfast is the most important meal of the day, you can't get away from the fact that what we eat and when is an important choice and the sum of all of these choices, every meal, every day, combine to help us define our health. I'd love to hear what you think of this paper and my analysis. You can find me on Twitter at Brianna Stubbs. And as ever, we love to hear what you think about the HVMN podcast as a whole. So please write in to podcast at hvmn.com with any questions, topic suggestions, feedback, and subscribe on your podcast platform or on YouTube. Until next time, train hard, look after yourself and live well. Thanks so much for tuning in this week, everyone. If you want to learn more about HVMN and our offerings, visit www.hvmn.com forward slash pod. Also, by writing a review on our iTunes page and sending a screenshot to podcast at hvmn.com, we'll hook you up with $15 worth of HVMN store credit. Our last shout out goes to our listener survey, which lets us know who you are better so we can continue making episodes that you find most valuable. So visit go.hvmn.com forward slash podcast survey. For that, it'll only take a few minutes and new submissions are eligible for an HVMN ketone giveaway. So it's well worth the time. Until next time, study smart, train hard and live well.